Oh, it's you. Welcome to today's documentary on class with a little bit of, well, me. The Guardian has published a jolly good article about our class system titled The Great British Class Survey with chaps like me on to in the top class because of our, well, immense wealth. But I wonder, is it really just the money or is it my refined cultural taste? Ah, oh, great. That again. Oh, yeah, thanks for disturbing me. I'll turn the camera now. Who would have thought that horse riding is such an upper class thing to do? If you can afford them. The participants of the Great British Class were, of course, also asked about their occupation. But what kind of jobs is typical for upper class? What kind of jobs is typical for lower class? Education was another one of those factors according to which classes people had been assigned to. The remaining question is in how far one's education influences the class you're in and vice versa. Oh, reading is one of the biggest pleasures in life. A shame not everyone does it. I wonder, can the lower class even read properly? I severely doubt that. Did you know that certain activities like going to the gym and going to the opera are associated with certain class? Why is that though? So far we have mentioned several factors which all influence the social class of a person. Housing, cultural capital, how recreational time is spent, education, occupation, language and income are all constituent factors. There are of course more factors which play a role. In a series of videos to which this is an introduction, our fellow students are going to give you a more detailed look at each factor. But before our fellow students give you an in-depth presentation on all of those factors, it is necessary to examine the historical development of the British social class system, and in particular, to, to examine the Great British Class Survey of 2013, which greatly influenced our work in class, and the videos, which are its immediate results. Absolutely right, Vadim. To achieve this, we will start with the historical development in ancient Greece and various developments in the following centuries, ending our examination with a theory established by Karl Marx. After this, we will fill you in on the particularities of the Great British Class Survey, or more precisely, its results and the subsequent new take on class in England. First off, you surely realize that our short clips were far from the truth of today's class system, if there is any. In fact, class is such a complex construct, the more people you ask, the more definitions you will get for the concept of class. But where does the term class come from? As early as ancient Greece, philosophers such as Aristotle dealt with questions on and about class. Class was closely tied to wealth. Only wealthy citizens were able to afford the costly hoplite armor, and only hoplites were able to vote in the state assembly. So only people able to defend the state were able to vote and had a right to call themselves citizens. How many were there? Although it is difficult to pinpoint a definite percentage, it was undoubtedly only a small minority ranging from 10 to maybe 20%, depending on the time frame. A similar militaristic socio-economic class system existed throughout the time of the Roman Empire. Censors divided the Roman citizenry into different classes according to their ability to buy their own arms. But in contrast to Greece, even the poor were able to vote. They could not, however, be elected for state offices. Later, during medieval times, classes were seen more strict and rigid. However, that was by no means the case in reality. Although you had established classes like the nobility, the clergy or the peasants, the boundaries, especially between the lower few classes, were seen more fluid and somewhat blurry. Especially with the rise of the merchant and middle, the citizen class, boundaries between the classes were no longer clear-cut and there was significant vertical fluidity. Many merchants were in fact richer than most of the nobility. In 1583, in the Elizabethan era, the, diplo the English diplomat, Sir Thomas Smith, described the English society as divided into four classes. First, we are the gentlemen's, meaning the king, his barons and lords. Then the citizens or burgesses. Also the yeomen, artisans, and last but not least, the laborers. So again, we see a distinction along the lines of rank and wealth. Rank and wealth were the two predominant factors in deciding your role in the society for centuries. 
Although your profession also played a role, it was too closely tied to wealth as to play a role in its own. During the Industrial Revolution, many philosophers and state theoreticians went so far as to divide solely between the working class, or poor class, and the capitalist class, or rich class, those, those two classes who would later become the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. So, Marx was not the first one to come up with those terms. God, no. Writers mm. such as David Ricardo or Chaffourier mentioned those terms in their works decades before Marx did. Henri Saint-Samon even described the French Revolution as class struggle. Half a century before Marx came up with the term. That's interesting. So Marx is not the only... F not Well, he was not the only one. And not the first one to describe the industrial society as divided into two opposite classes. Not at all, not at all. He did, however, establish the theory that the class struggle would inevitably lead to the dictatorship of the proletariat. But yet again, we see a class system established on socio-economic factors, depending on your role in the production cycle. So in other words, where you either producing or controlling the production. Only recently we have seen a new effort to categorize classes in England based on various factors like cultural and social capital. We read about all these class fights Marx prophesied in his class theory, but is all this still valid? Well, no. Now, as mentioned a few minutes ago, let us talk about the Great British Class Survey. In 2011, the BBC Lab UK offered a survey on its website consisting of questions about leisure activities and interests, occupation, housing, income, education and all the like. A tremendous number of 160,000 people participated in this survey. What is most remarkable about the survey was that, while other surveys concerned with class and social status may be interested in financial affairs first and foremost, the Great British Class Survey also asked questions about social relations, so who you know, what kind of social activities you engage in, and so on. These questions about social affairs investigated the social capital of a, of a participant, which, together with the economic capital, which means the financial aspect and the so-called cultural capital constituted by the individual's engagement in highbrow, such as attending the theater, opera, and exhibitions, and emerging culture such as concerts, video games, sports, and so on, constitute the social class of the participant. After the survey was closed to participants, a team of academic experts, among them Mike Savage and Fiona Devine, published an in-depth analysis of the survey's results in the journal Sociology in April 2013. Based on their findings, they were able to draw a number of interesting conclusions about social class in England today. First off, Karl Marx was wrong or at least no longer applicable. The twofold class system he applied both to history and his own time was too simple. Most importantly, in modern day Britain, it was no longer possible to categorize everybody in the threefold class system of upper, middle and lower class. Secondly, as already implied, the researchers were able to establish not only one additional class, but four. At the top of this new seven class scale, we have the so-called elite, next on the social ladder is the established middle class, followed by the technical middle class, probably the first of the newer classes. They in turn are followed by the new affluent workers, who are socially above the traditional working class, which was already present in Karl Marx's theorem. The lowest two classes in this new model are the emergent service sector and the precariat. If this was too fast for you, don't worry. We are going to talk about all seven in more detail. Let us start with the top of the crop, the elite. They are, per definition, the most privileged and advantaged social group in the United Kingdom. They have the highest sum of all three capitals. With a mean annual income of 89,000, which is almost twice the amount of next class earns, and an average house value of £325,000, the economic capital is basically enormous, which is reinforced by the high savings. They also tend to have the highest number of social contacts and the biggest high-level cultural capital, but not only highbrow. Furthermore, they include the lowest proportion of ethnic minorities of all classes, and the highest number of graduates, according to Savage. The established middle class has a household income of about 47,000 a year and owns a house worth 177,000 on average. Their savings are about 26,000. They score well in economic capital and rival the technical middle class in this regard. The established middle class is considerably larger than the elite, according to Savage et al. They make up around a quarter of the British population. A high proportion of this class works in management and the professions more than the other classes, except for the elite. 
When it comes to social context, this class outdoes the elite and their contacts tend to be high status, which means their contacts are equally well off. The established middle class tends to be highly culturally engaged in both in high pro culture and emerging cultural capital. Broadly speaking, members of this class are highly secure across all three forms of capital. The technical middle class makes up only 6% of the British population, but is nevertheless a relatively wealthy class with mean household incomes of £38,000 yearly, better household savings than the established middle class at around 66000 and houses worth 163000 on average. As already mentioned, it rivals the established middle class for the spot of the second wealthiest class. However, it cannot match the established middle class in terms of social and cultural capital. Across all classes, it has the lowest number of social contacts, with only 4 out of 34 possible contacts. This might be due to the habit of socializing almost exclusively with other professional experts. Culturally speaking, people in this class display lower levels of cultural capital and can thus be regarded as more or less culturally disengaged, as explained by Savage and others. The new affluent workers make up 5.4% of the population and they have a moderate household income. The average house value of their homes is 129,000 and they have a comparatively small sum of savings. Savage therefore described them as economically secure without being very well off. They have the second highest number of social contacts, although the status of these contacts is moderate. The new affluent workers score highly on emerging cultural capital, but they score lower in high pro cultural capital. In general, they score well on all three capitals. Members of this group tend to come from non-middle class families and some of them have been to university. The majority of them is male with 57% men and a high proportion of young people. Among his graduates, most graduated from new universities such as Bowdoin or the University of West England. The traditional working class accounts for about 2% of the British population. They are a rather poor class which has a mean annual income of about £13,000 but most of its members own their homes, which come at an average price of £127,000, yet the savings are modest at best. Their social contacts are rather limited as well, with 10 of the 34 possible contacts, and those contact status is moderate too. In general, they score low on all three measures of capital, according to Savage. Nevertheless, as we already mentioned, they are not the bottom of this class system, as they were in the older descriptions. Emergent service workers have an average annual income of 21,000, but the proportion of this class who rent is high and they have limited savings. They have a large number of social contacts of moderate status and they prefer emerging cultural capital more than any other class, yet their hypercultural capital is low. As can be seen, their economic capital may be low, but their social and cultural capital is high. A class relatively young with a mean age of 34, it also includes a high proportion of ethnic minorities. Its members tend not to be graduates and they do not come from middle class families. As the name implies, they work in the service sector in fields such as chefs, customer service and call centers. The final class, the precariat, is characterized by its low household income of £8,000 per year, small savings and a likeliness to rent. They have only 7 contacts on average, whose social status is the lowest of any of the classes. The scores of this class for cultural capital are low for both types making them the most culturally deprived class, although they make 15% of the population. In terms of occupation, they are overrepresented among the unemployed, van drivers, cleaners, carpenters, care workers, cashiers, postal workers and also shopkeepers. The likeliness to have attended university is, according to Savage, low. All in all, let us conclude that the threefold class system, although still widely used and applied to British society is in fact no longer valid. The GBCS has shown that there are actually seven classes, characterized by differing amounts of cultural, social and economical capital. Yet, the view that money determines the social class is most notorious. In the following series of videos, our fellow students will investigate the cultural and social component of social class in more detail and endeavor to find out just how important money really is. This is it for our video. We hope you enjoyed what you saw so far, but don't forget it's only a starting point. And there are many more videos waiting for you to watch them, if you're still interested in the social class system in Britain. So tune in, and God save the Queen.